Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us, and welcome to the Astro 3D Easier Astronomers in Astro Australia seminar series. My name is Yifei Jin. I'm a PhD student at the Australian National University. My co-chair is Anisha Hashan from the University of New South Wales. Before we begin, it's important for us to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today. The Aboriginal and the Torres Strait Islander people were Australia's first astronomers, and we acknowledge their long-standing systems of knowledge on which we continue to build. We acknowledge the traditional custodians of the unceded lands on which we are meeting today. I am speaking with you today from the land of Nanao and Nambri country. My co-chair Anisha is joining us from the land of Adigo people. Our first speaker, Alec Thompson, is speaking to you from the Wajak people of Nano land. And the second speaker, Doug Evans Burgate, is speaking from the land of Jabo and Jarawa people of the Tumba area. We pay our respects to the elders past and present and extend the respect to all first people joining us here today. So why are we here? This series is facilitated by Astro3D, the ARC Center of Excellence for All Sky Astrophysics in Three Dimensions. COVID-19 has affected our ability to travel and present at international seminars this year, especially for us in Australia. The time zones mean that often meetings take place at two or three in the morning. This lack of opportunity to network could disadvantage junior astronomers when entering the job market. This series aims to combat these issues by providing a platform for junior Australian astronomers to present their work to the world. There will be two talks over this hour. Each will be 20 minutes in length with five minutes for questions at the end of each talk. Please save your questions until the end of each talk. Feel free to use the chat function to ask your question if you prefer and Anisha can read it out for our presenter. These talks are being recorded and will be placed afterwards on the Astro3D YouTube channel for educational and scientific purpose. By being here today, you are agreeing to abide by Astro3D's meeting code of conduct. I have already warned the speakers of this, but because of the limitation of Zoom, I will need to interrupt with five minutes to go in each talk. So first, our first speaker is Alex Thompson, who is the postdoc at CSIRO. So Alex, the screen is yours. Wonderful, thank you, Yifei. I'll just get my screen share set up. Okay, just to confirm the full screen view is coming through okay? Yes. Okay, fantastic. Um, so, uh, my name is Alec Thompson. I am, a, as Ife said, I'm a postdoc at CSIRO in Perth. Um, and yes, I'd also like to start off by acknowledging the land um, from which I'm speaking to today, the, um, of the Wajak people of the Noongar Nation, and pay respect to their elders past, present, and emerging. Um, so, I'm really excited to, you to speak to you all today about the latest and greatest in continuum surveys that's coming out of the Australian Square Kilometre Array Pathfinder, or ASCAP, in the form of spice racks. And so I'd like to start off today um, by motivating uh, the science which um, drives the things that I'm really interested in. And that is in particular cosmic magnetism. Um, and I hope that no matter kind of what part of the universe you happen to be interested in, um, you can find magnetic fields there and find something you can latch onto and become interested in yourself. So magnetic fields are a fundamental part of the universe and they pervade all different size scales from the very largest um, size scales in the cosmic web um, down through um, galaxy clusters and individual galaxies, including the Milky Way, and right, right down to very, very dense matter such as pulsars. However, due to uh, the difficulty in directly observing magnetic fields, that is, we can't directly observe them, we have to infer them from other observations, there remain a number of unresolved problems um, relating to magnetic fields, including their original origin in the universe, how they've evolved through cosmic time, 
and their structure and influence in clusters and, um, and in, inside individual galaxies, including the Milky Way in which we sit. Um, and there's also interesting physics problems that we still want to investigate, say in the um, astrophysical jets, such as in AGN, and as well as in very, very dense matter, such as um, pulsars and neutron stars. The ob observational mechanism I'm gonna be focusing on today that can help us to resolve these problems will be through polarized radio emission. Um, and in particular, I'm gonna be focusing on synchrotron radiation and other forms of polarized emission. The nice thing about synchrotron emission, which is produced by um, electrons or positrons spiraling around magnetic fields, is that it can be highly polarized, so up to about 70%. Um, and that polarization angle of synchrotron emission actually corresponds to the um, magnetic field as projected on the plane of the sky. So if we can observe the polarization angle of synchrotron emission, that already informs us about the plane of the sky magnetic field we're, observ we're observing, excuse me. Along with this, I'm also really interested in Faraday rotation. So Faraday rotation is um, an effect which applies to um, polarized waves, so including the, the waves that come from synchrotron emission. And as that wave propagates through a, magneti a magnetoionic gas, the polarization angle will change as a function of wavelength and magnetic field projected along the line of sight. Um, so it is very strongly wavelength dependent. In fact, it's wavelength squared dependent. And the total amount of rotation is uh, given by an integrated quantity of the magnetic field along the line of sight, so projected along the line of sight, weighted by the electron density. And we quantify this in two primary ways. The first is known as the rotation measure, or RM, and you'll often see this quoted in the literature. And it is truly a, an observational quantity, and it, it corresponds to the total amount of um, rotation per wavelength squared integrated along the entire line of sight. And so it gives you an integrated um, magnetic field strength weighted by an integrated electron density. Along with this and defined quite similarly, but still uh, uh, differently is the Faraday depth. Faraday depth is a real physical quantity, which can actually be defined similar to optical depth. It can be defined at any point along the line of sight. And it corresponds to the amount of Faraday rotation per wavelength squared that's, that has occurred out to that particular distance. So it is a function of distance along the line of sight. Um, and I should note that I've, the figure I've borrowed here is from a recent paper by Katia Ferre. Um, and so it's called the uh, correct sense of Faraday rotation. And it actually provides a really good um, basis if you're looking to um, as a textbook definitions of all these kinds of things, the paper is actually an incredibly concise and useful guide to that. So I'd recommend reading it if you're wanting to find out more. So this is, so this is a little cartoon sketch of what we end up um, seeing observationally. So we look at the polarization fraction of a radio wave. And in the, in the very simple case of that, we have a background polarized source propagating through some magnetoionic medium, we end up seeing a sinusoidal oscillation in our Stokes Q and U parameters. So the linear polarization of the wave. Um, and this corresponds to a constant um, rotation of the polarization angle as a function of wavelength squared. Um, if you go slightly more complicated than this, but still relatively simple, that is if we have mixed emission and rotation, we end up seeing a sink-like depolarization that is the polarization fraction goes down as a function of wavelength squared. Um, so the important thing to note here is that to be able to discriminate between these two different scenarios, we need measurements of many, many, um, many, many different values of wavelength squared. Um, and in particular, and I'll highlight this in a moment, it is long, it is long wavelengths, so um, even low radio frequencies that give us the most amount of coverage of wavelength squared. Um, an important thing to note though, that very low radio frequencies will be further down this sine, this sink curve. And so they will tend to um, see fewer polarized sources. So really when we're observed, when we're wanting to observe these magnetic fields with, from polarized radio emission, we're quite greedy. We really want to get as many values of wavelength squared as we can get our hands on. Now, given that we have these two, this, this sinusoidal and sink-like functions, what we actually do is a process called RM synthesis which is a, essentially taking the Fourier transform of these observations. And what's really nice is when we take the Fourier transform of these sink and sine curves, 
uh, the Fourier conjugate of wavelength squared versus polarization fraction is actually our Faraday depth. And so this tells us how much Faraday rotation um, has applied to that piece of emission. And so for the simple foreground screen model, we end up with effectively a delta function at the particular Faraday depth. And when we have mixed emission and rotation, let's say that sync function, um, we end up with something like a top hat, something that is broader. And, and we use this to characterize what is happening along the line of sight. Now, this, the word RM synthesis actually gets its name um, from being similar to aperture synthesis in radio astronomy, where we take the Fourier transform um, of, our obs of the um, plane of the sky. And similar to aperture synthesis in where you have a beam or a point spread function, and the size of that beam in a radio interferometer is determined by our longest baseline. So by moving our antennas further apart from one another, we end up with a smaller PSF or greater, um, uh, uh, greater resolution. In RM synthesis, we have what's called an RM spread function or an RMSF that's actually determined by our um, longest wavelength squared that we observe. So here I'm showing an RMSF um, from the first ever detection of, ro of a rotation measure in an astrophysical sense from Cooper and Price in 1962 with the Parkes Radio Telescope. And now if we make our wavelengths longer, and here I'm showing a longer wavelength, a longer wavelength observation, our RMSF gets narrower. So our RM resolution has become much narrower. Similarly, in the same way in radio interferometry, when we make our observation, we actually start off with what we call the dirty map. So it has been the image that we first make has been convolved with this RMSF. And when we first do RM synthesis, because we discreetly sample um, the wavelength squared space, we end up with a dirty spectrum. That is the, the spectrum that we observe is convolved with this ripply RM spread function. So here I'm showing the real, a real observation from Cooper and Price in 1962. And so we have to do some kind of deconvolution. And actually we have a, essentially a 1D parallel to the clean algorithm that's used in radio astronomy. In this case, it's called RM clean. And you can see we can find the peak in the spectrum here. It's about minus 60 or so radians per square meter. And that tells us our, our um, rotation measure towards a particular source. So the type of experiment we want to do is called the rotation measure grid or the RM grid. And we're using this quite amazing cosmic coincidence, which is that at radio frequencies, we have the strongest amount of Faraday rotation. So it's actually measurable and detectable. And so we can probe the foreground um, line of sight magnetic field and that linearly polarized emission is abundant via synchrotron radiation from things like AGM, like I'm showing in an image here, and even star forming galaxies. And so what we want to do is use these sources to probe the foreground material. So that could be the intergalactic medium or a particular galaxy or clusters of galaxies. And then on larger size scales, you can have things like the Milky Way that we want to try and probe. So to do this, we require broad bandwidth. So we want to measure many different values of wavelength squared. And this allows us to distinguish between simple and complex scenarios along the line of sight. We also want to survey a large area to characterize large scale foregrounds, such as the Milky Way. We want to have a high sensitivity so we can um, increase the number of sources that we detect. So the higher the, number, the higher the source density we have, the smaller to the angular scale we can probe. Um, so at the moment, so with a shallow source density, you can only probe large angular scales, such as with the Milky Way. But say if you wanted to probe a small scale um, galaxy cluster, you need a much higher number of sources per square degree. Um, and then if you're interested in the source itself, you also want high angular resolution to try and study that intrinsic magnetoionic structure. So this is the current state of the art. So this is a compilation of essentially all rotation measure sources ever collected, which is around 50,000 sources distributed across the entire sky. The bulk of these are from NVSS, which was done with the VLA, which contributes about 37,000 sources across the Northern Hemisphere. Um, and that equates to about approximately one source per every square degree. More recently, um, there has been a survey at the South with um, the uh, Australia Telescope Compact Array, which produced about four, four and a half thousand sources or, or roughly one per every five square degrees. Um, so this still leaves us with a problem though, in that we only have about 3000 sources for declination south of 40 degrees. And that's commonly known as, as the Southern Hole. And that really we're limited by the NVSS source density of one per square degree, which limits the angular scales that we want to be able to probe. 
Um, a lot, another problem that MBSS has is that it only has two narrowly spaced frequencies, which actually with only two, we end up with an n pi ambiguity, which means there's actually an infinite number of Faraday of rotation measures that could correspond to that measurement. And it also can't tell us anything about the complexity along the line of sight. And this is where instruments such as ASCAP, the Australian Square Chronometer Array Pathfinder is really changing the game. So ASCAP is designed as a, from the ground up as a survey instrument. And so if you aren't familiar with ASCAP, it's a 36 antenna array with up to six kilometer baselines. Um, but its real power is in its receiver, these phase array feeds. And that essentially turns ASCAP into 36 parallel um, interferometer telescopes running at the same time. And it forms 36 beams on the sky and that can cover in a simultaneous observation around 30 square degrees in a single pointing. It also is able to um, image up to 288 megahertz of bandwidth instantaneously, and it's flexibly tunable between 700 to 1800 megahertz, 700 megahertz to 1800 megahertz. Another really useful thing is that ASCAP actually has a pseudo equatorial mount. So these dishes are able to rotate around to track the sky, and that is actually incredibly useful for polarization calibration. And I'm sure you will have heard um, probably some of the names I've listed down below of the five year surveys that are due to begin very soon. And the largest of which being EMU and Wallaby. And of course, Possum, which I'm involved in, which is the polarization counterpart to EMU, which will uh, carry out uh, a deep survey of the entire sky. Ahead of that, however, um, as the observatory, we've actually con already conducted an all sky survey with ASCAP known as RACS, the Rapid ASCAP Continuum Survey. So unlike the other surveys, which are um, based by or run by international collaborations, RACS is a, an observatory project. So it's done by the ASCAP observatory itself. It has um, mapped the entire Southern sky from the South Celestial Pole up to a declination of plus 40 in full continuum, polar in full continuum polarization. And so it's done this in a roughly 1,015 minute integrations. So that means it's imaged the entire sky in about two weeks. So compared to um, previous attempts at this, RACS is able to image at RACS did in two weeks what would normally take years to achieve. Um, I'm showing here on the right RACS in comparison to two other large area surveys being NBSS and SUMS. So RACS is centered on the RACS low observations, which I'm showing the images for here, are centered on 888 megahertz and have an average um, point spread function of around 15 arc seconds which is about twice that of NVSS and SOMS and is about twice as sensitive. Um, so RACS low has now been completely observed, um, reduced and now has been published by Dave McConnell pictured there in the top right. Um, and the RACS low images and um, source lists are now publicly available on CASDA. And as I found out recently, the images are now available on Aladdin um, so I strongly recommend if you want to send a couple of hours away, uh, just scroll through those images and look up beautiful radio galaxies. We have also finished observations of RACS mid. Um, these are now being processed by Stefan, pictured down at the bottom, who's recently joined us at CSIRO, and he will be taking care of the processing and cataloging. Because now, speaking of cataloging, um, okay, thanks. Uh, Catherine Hale has been leading the work on cataloging RACS low. Um, and I believe she's on the call as well. <laughs> um, so it's nice to have you here, Catherine. So Catherine's now at University of Edinburgh. Um, for this catalog, we selected a common resolution of 25 arc seconds to give us the greatest contiguity across the entire sky. So that included about 800 or so tiles. Um, and from this, Catherine was able to catalog about 2.1 million sources um, comprised of about two and a half million Gaussian components. And Catherine is also able to show that for, in terms of completeness, we are 95% complete at, for point sources down to five Milijanskis. So you're probably all wondering, well, what is Spice Racks then? Well, Spice Racks is a project called for spectra and polarization and cutouts of extragalactic sources from racks. Um, in short, it's the linearly polarized, uh, polarized results from racks. And it also has the benefit of being a quadruple nested acronym. Um, so if you like, Rax is effectively a shallow emu, and Spice Rax is effectively a shallow possum. And so Spice Rax still remains an observatory project. However, it is being completed and in collaboration with the um, possum collaboration team. So as part of Spice Rax, I have been developing an accelerated pipeline, um, which is uh, as an alternative to the way we process normal full depth images from ASCAP. 
And that's because Rax is done in a snapshot mode, and so it is best at characterizing compact sources. And so we avoid producing these large um, image products to save on both disk space and time. And our primary aim is to produce a shallow all sky catalog. And we expect that we'll uh, be able to catalog around 10 to the five sources in linear polarization, which equates to around two to five sources per square degree. Um, so I've been implementing this pipeline. It's built on the Python platform of Dask, which allows it to scale um, to any cluster you'd like to run it on. And we take in the images, do cutouts, um, mosaic the cutouts together, um, extract those spectra, run the RM synthesis, and compile that together into our rotation measure catalog. To put this in comparison to other surveys, so this is from a, a recent review paper by George Heald. Um, this is showing on the y-axis polarized source density. So um, the more sources are at the top and the widest, wider surveys are further to the right. Um, so Spice Rack sits here, so above NBSS, but still below um, where we're gonna go with full possum and SKA. So give you an idea of what this would look like. So this is a simulated image of what you get with at least two sources per square degree. And you can see that we're definitely gonna be pushing the, southern, uh, the hole from the south back to the north. Um, and so this would make Spice Racks the largest ever catalog of polarized sources. So ahead of the full release, we are um, currently processing a pilot chunk of the racks fields. Um, so this is about 30 racks fields, which is almost a thousand square degrees with a specific science project in mind of investigating the magnetized turbulence in a nearby H2 region around the Spiker star. The nice thing about this is that it's large on the sky and also nearby um, and is also quite isolated. It's at a relatively high galactic latitude, which gives us a pristine line of sight um, to investigate the magnetized turbulence towards this H2 region. Um, and so this will really enable us to demonstrate the power of spice racks given that it'll enable us to characterize simple and complex sources and also cover a very wide area of sky. And um, so the nice thing about this is that in comparison to NVSS, we'll be able to probe nearly five times lower in terms of spatial, uh, spatial densities in investigating the magnetoionic properties of this nearby region. So processing for this is currently underway. Um, so with at 888 megahertz, we're achieving about 50 radians per square meter um, in Faraday resolution. So that gives us really good um, resolution in terms of how well we can characterize the Faraday rotation. I'm showing here a lovely example spectra of what we can achieve with spice racks, this lovely sinusoidal curves you can see in Stokes Q and U. Um, I'm currently reporting a preliminary polarized source count from these observations of around three sources per square degree. And that's quite a big preliminary number though in that we still have to deal with a primary systematic of wide field leakage. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar, um, interferometers, when you observe in the wide field, the further away you go from your pointing center, you have stronger um, instrumental polarization. And ASCAP actually forms 36 wide field images. And so towards the edges of these images, as I'm showing here, you have quite strong instrumental polarization. Um, and because this is quite complex to characterize as we sample the focal plane with our phase rate feeds. However, we now actually have a holographic correction method in place. Um, and this is something that I've been working towards. So I'm happy to speak more in detail about that if you've been interested as well. So this is where I'll finish up and I'm happy to take any questions. Cool, thank you, Adam. Very nice talk, thank you very much. So is there any questions from you? Uh, we got fun. Um, do you expect number of polarized sources uh, to decrease? Um, as a as a function of, of what do you mean with time? I'm I'm sorry. Do you, uh, to decrease or increase? <laughs> um, this is the question. Uh, could Brian Britton uh, Harper either uh, the sources per area? Sources per air. Sorry, I still, I'm still not sure what you mean in terms of the, for them to decrease. Um, as we go to higher frequencies, we should actually, the, we should be able to detect more um, because they'll be less depolarized. And as, with higher angular resolution as well, we get less um, beam depolarization. Um, and this, but this is still something that is a relatively unanswered question because we only have a couple of large area surveys. Um, so the, the actual, the, the source density statistics is, will be a very important result that we get out. 
um, in terms of how many sources end up being depolarized. Um, but they should increase as a function of as a function of frequency. So any other questions? Thank you, Eric. Thanks. Thank you.